Here we are again. Daimoku Sancho, please. Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo Nam Here we are, chapter three. Moving right along. Now, chapter three and again I'm reading from this uh as it says on the cover, a contemporary translation of a Buddhist classic, the Lotus Sutra. Um so there's gonna be some assumptions in the language here. And this is why I want to talk through it, because I want to make sure that uh in these talks, at least, I can help uh, or I can lend some depth of clarity to make this text, no matter how it's translated, more um, penetrable, more uh, to obviate its meaning more. Uh, the purpose of, practice, of study in Buddhism is not to uh, memorize the words, although that's how it was first taught, right? Uh, but it was taught in order to inculcate uh, a type of thinking. It was a teaching about how to think. So it wasn't about the words so much as it was using the words as a tool to lead to clarification, to greater um perceptive skills so that one could understand uh, meaning. Um, this seems to be the history of man with language. Whenever we want to transmit meaning in something, we uh, try to take examples either from uh, folklore, you know, uh, uh, stories that are told and why are those story, stories made up and why are those stories, uh, why do they end up being traditional classics and told over and over and over again, fables, um, uh, this kind of thing, analogies, uh, because um, our human condition, samsara, uh, and I talked about this before, our mind of distinctions our human minds like to make patterns because by pattern identification, there's that word again, identification, by pattern identification, we derive meaning. We derive uh, a, a sense of knowing, which you might call knowledge. Um, so, uh, what Shakyamuni has done in the last chapter is identify this as a skillful means. In other words, uh, or an expedient device. It has different translations. But basically what he's saying is, uh, don't, you know, all of these stories and analogies and, and uh, discussions and these great meetings with the endless numbers of sands of the Ganges, bodhisattvas, and blah, 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 blah. These are all um, mental ideas, thought exercises for you to comprehend uh, sometimes just the largesse of what I'm about to say, the import of something I'm trying to get you to understand. In other cases, they're complete story fabrications or folklore that you're all familiar with, and I'm going to... Um, use them in order to explore a type of um, understanding, a type of uh, experiential understanding, what is sometimes called uh, uh, morality, um, uh, a good versus evil kind of thing to be about, you know, how we set about relating to one another, how we identify and create patterns for ourselves. Because now, this is more now we're dealing into uh, the mental process, trying to get you to look inward at what's going on in your mind, rather than simply using your mind 
to identify more stuff. Uh, this is a bit of a conundrum in Buddhism because um, the words, the, the creation of language is all about uh, manipulating our perception of what we identify, samsara. So the words have in them identification. Basically, that's what words are. Um, and what Shakyamuni is trying to discuss is non-identification. So how do you use identification in order to analyze and dissect the method of identification, not solely to understand that it is a process, but to subvert it to to move away from it, to let that identification process, which is cellular, beneath cellular, it is, it is the condition of the human mind. How do you transcend that condition? How do you no longer identify? So the language that's used of identification, um, identifies non-identifiable things. So there's always these two realities. Sometimes it's called the two minds of Buddhism. Um, but that's also an identification, isn't it? So sometimes the language gets confusing because the language, uh, especially of the fables, identifies specific identifications of things, name, it's one of the core concepts. If you look at dependent uh, origination or the 12 link causal chain of Nidana, uh, one of the links of the creation of, of, of amalgams of, uh, of karma itself, even before it, karma combines in order to create skandhas, the five aggregates, um, one of the stages is called Namarupa. Uh, name and form, uh, which is two things, the beginning of the duality, okay? Um, and that there's the crux of the uh, conditional problem we have of suffering in life is that we see everything in that duality of name and form. Well, what's another way of talking about name and form? Identification. Because in order to identify, the assumption of other is implicit, explicit, really. Right? Because if you're going to name something, that something has to exist. And if it exists, it's because it is not you. What is it? What is you? If not something different, something other. The duality is so ingrained at such a fine, minute level um, that escaping it is, uh, well, it's not an easy thing. It's difficult to understand and it's impossible to talk about. But once you can perceptively I, <laughs> identify it, um, there's hope that you can move toward it uh, to a more and more explicit experience, even though in this life, we're always going to be in a duality until we leave life. But uh, that's a slippery slope, because if if you don't get it correctly, you might get the impression that the only way to attain enlightenment is to leave this life. Um, and again, that duality plays in those words because you could say, well, yeah, that's right. You have to leave this life. What do we mean when we say leave this life? We don't mean leave this life by dying. What we mean is leave this life of perception of this life and see this life as an undifferentiated 
amazing process. And so I keep coming back to other words like attitude, uh, insight, and insight is actually a word that's used a lot in uh, the perfection of wisdom, in Mahayana teaching, in Hinayana teaching. It's just that what we attach those words to is a function of how deeply we understand their meaning. And this is the whole effort, practice, difficulty of Buddhism. Okay? So, I say all of this because you have to imagine that 2,600 years ago when people heard that second chapter, uh, a lot of people only heard it. See, the Buddha traveled in his teaching life all over India, uh, north and south. It's a very big country. And the only way these teachings were transmitted was verbally. So there was an entourage that followed him. Some of them didn't follow him throughout his entire life. Some of them left uh, after they had learned a certain amount or, 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 um, I was going to say recited, but, uh, memorized a certain amount and took those teachings and went out into the world, into other parts of India and so forth, uh, to recite what they had memorized. And so a great many people learned, uh, Buddha's, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings second hand, third hand, fourth hand. Um, and once they became uh, well-versed <laughs> in those sermons, um, they may, it may have been a great deal of time passed before uh, another monk traveling who had been following or rejoined and learned new sermons came to the into their lives to teach them the next step in understanding what Shakyamuni was teaching, or they may never have gotten any more information. So they would have thought, this is it. This is what I have to work with. Now, by what Shakyamuni just finished saying in the in the second chapter, um he he has been teaching the same truth all along. Um so yeah they could eventually, with what they know, attain enlightenment. But um, it's going to be very difficult given the information they've been given. Think about mathematics. All of us remember some level of mathematics. So if you went to school, even if you didn't go to school, somebody tried to teach you some math. Mathematics is very basic. Uh, understanding of numbers and the relationship of identifying things, patterns, as we do in Sapsara, uh, numerically. It's like another language. It's just, okay. And we, uh, and we, uh, you, you may remember when you started working with fractions. And then there was this wonderful theory called cancellation. And we used it in division and multiplication all the time. When this number is there and that number is also there, then we they cancel each other out. And then at some point in your math learning, you may have gotten to a little bit more advanced math. Maybe it was in geometry. Maybe it was in algebra. And fractions show up again, uh, especially in algebra. But now, not only with numbers, but with letters, placeholders. Um, and then we're told, oh, you know that cancellation thing you've done for decades? That's not what really happens. There's a property known as means extremes. And what happens is when you have, in multiplication and division only, when these numbers occur above and below the line, they create a fraction that's equal to one over one or or, or themselves uh, repeated, really. So in an equation, they end up forming the number one and in multi multiplication or division, that really functions as just a repetition of what's already there. It doesn't change anything. Well, that's a very different kind of thinking than cancellation, which 
implies disappears or or annihilates itself. Well, that's not what happens. It just becomes completely inert. Um, that's different than cancellation, right? Um, so this is what happens as the Buddha is moving through his teaching life. Shakyamuni is trying to elevate the consciousness of the students he has in in his entourage at the time and he keeps evolving and some of those students they leave and they're not following the next evolution so when they come back if they come back uh there's a whole new set of stories and fables and teachings um delivered that expand their thinking but by this time other people who are learning buddhism uh, don't have this new information so what i'm trying to point out is that even for those students who are following it and migrating with shakyamuni as he teaches um and even more so to those who leave to spread the teaching and either rejoin or just continue with what they know, waiting for other students to come to them to elevate them, there's a there's kind of a segmentation of understanding, if you will. So he, realizing this, of course, he's Shakyamuni Buddha. He just dropped, and this is why I say, he just kind of dropped a bomb on everybody. Uh, and, and we learned about it in the Innumerable Meaning Sutra, remember? It said, for these 42 or 40 some years I've been teaching, I've not yet expressed the full truth. So you've been following this teacher for 42 years. I mean, you couldn't wait to get out of high school after grade 12. Imagine 42 years of constant study and traveling and repeating these sutras and these sermons right and then your teacher says okay i've been teaching you this cancellation thing and now you need to like kind of set that aside uh, discard your focus on that and now what i'm going to teach you is what's really going on well, a lot of a lot of those people, either in the entourage or those who learn about this later, are going to be like, really, really, because all of this really works. I'm really learning a lot. I'm a, it's changed my life. Now you're telling me that I don't understand it that that now you're going to tell me how it works <laughs> so that created quite a ripple effect and he, and he knew it he knew that a lot of doubt would arise from something like that so all of this is to preface you for chapter three in which he's going to open the chapter with a conversation with Shariputra about this doubt now Shariputra is uh, at this point an arhat he's quite educated and quite um experienced in the teachings of shakyamuni um but he now finds out that what he knows is doesn't amount to what he thinks he knows um And so I'll just get into it. And, and then once that occurs in the chapter, the Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni then explores one of the famous fables of the Lotus Sutra in which he explains, I'm sorry this is happening, but it had to happen. And I'll tell you uh, a story to explain to you why it's happening this way. But nonetheless, it's, it's happening and this story will explain to you how critical it is that this is happening so hopefully that helps here we go the chapter oddly enough is named a parable
<laughs> it may have other translations, but this translation, and in many, it's called a parable. But it doesn't start with the parable. It starts with a reason why the parable is necessary in order to, once again, teach by the use of a parable the meaning of what's now happening, what chapter 2 has caused in a lot of people's minds. It's shaking them up. All right. At that time, Shariputra, ecstatic with joy, stood up put his palms together, reverently looked up at the face of the Honorable One and said to him, quote, Hearing this sound of the Dharma from the World Honored One, I am filled with ecstasy, something I have never experienced before. Why? When we heard such a Dharma, now, see, it went from me to we. Again, these are all mental exercises. So this audience, he keeps wanting to refer to this audience because he wants to make sure he's understood that speaking to everyone, no matter what your state, but he's using the device of Shariputra to have a conversation about something that applies to everyone. So it's, it's built into the language of the sermon, you see. When we heard such a Dharma from the Buddha before, we saw that bodhisattvas were assured of becoming Buddhas, but not that we ourselves were. And we were very distressed at never being able to have a Tathagata's immeasurable insight. World Honored One, whenever I was alone under the trees in a main mountain forest, whether sitting or walking, I was occupied with this thought. We have all equally entered Dharma nature. Why does the Tathagata offer us salvation only by the Dharma of a small vehicle? This is our own fault, not the fault of the World Honored One. Why? Because had we waited to hear you teach how to attain supreme awakening, we would certainly have been saved by the great vehicle, but not understanding your way of preaching by skillful means according to what is appropriate when we first heard the buddha dharma we only passively believed and accepted it pondered it and were informed by it world honored one ever since then i have spent whole days and nights blaming myself but now hearing from the buddha the unprecedented dharma that i have never heard before all my doubts and regrets are over. I am mentally and physically at ease and happily at peace. Today, having received my share of the Buddha Dharma, I realize that I really am a child of Buddha, born from the Buddha's mouth and transformed by the Dharma. So he just came to the realization that his Buddha nature is innate and that it's been there all along and all these devices that he's learned so well were only to get him to understand that point rather than seeing it as some distant goal. There's that duality again, right? At that time, wanting to say what he meant once again, Shariputra spoke in verse. And I'm not going to read it all, but I'll read it some because you'll see how he digs into what he just said. Hearing the voice of this Dharma, now it's disembodied. It's not Shakyamuni, it's not him. It's the voice of this Dharma. So what does Dharma mean, right? It's not just teaching. It's the it's the meat of the teaching. It's the realization, the awakening, the, 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 the study itself. It's the, the aha-ness of discovery, right? And it's also that part of discovery that we, we, we tend to spend a lot of time exalting the act of discovery, the excitement of discovery, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking that discovery isn't, it, it, it may be a new 
quote unquote experience for us. But discovery is always about finding something that's been there all along. <laughs> So that's Dharma. I have something I have, I never had before. See? My heart is full of joy and the whole net of doubt is gone. Having received the Buddha's teachings from long ago, I have never been denied the great vehicle. The voice of the Buddha is only rarely heard, but it can rid living beings of suffering. So this is the realization that it's been there all along. Having already freed myself of fault, hearing this, I am also free from anxiety. Whether in a mountain valley or under the trees in a forest, whether sitting or walking around, I always thought about this matter and blamed myself completely, thinking, have I, why have I cheated myself so? We too are children of the Buddha and have entered the same flawless Dharma, yet in the future will not be able to preach the unexcelled way. We will never receive the golden body and the 32 characteristics, the 10 powers of various kinds of liberation, even though we are all alike in the one Dharma. We have completely missed such blessings as the 80 different wonderful attractive features and the 18 unique qualities. When I was walking around alone, I saw the Buddha in the great assembly, his fame reaching in all directions everywhere, bringing abundant benefits to living beings. I thought I had been deprived of this benefit, that I had been deceived. All day and night I pondered over these things and wanted to ask the world-honored one whether I had lost my opportunity or not. I always saw the world-honored one praising the bodhisattvas. Therefore, I thought about these things day and night. Because he was a Shravaka, he was a Pratyaka Buddha, he was an Arhat, but he wasn't a bodhisattva. So how come they get all the merit and I can't? So He's describing his path of doubt and how the last chapter shook him loose of that and provided for him that we are all Buddhas. And the path of the Bodhisattva is to not only immerse yourself in understanding that, but that to fully understand that is to bring other people along to that realization. Okay. Anyway, at the end of this, he says, I'm confident of becoming a Buddha, respected by human and heavenly beings, turning the unexcelled Dharma wheel, teaching and transforming many bodhisattvas. See, now he gets it. Then the Buddha said to Shariputra, quote, Now in this great assembly of human and heavenly beings, mendicants, Brahmins, and others, I say this. In the past, in the presence of two trillion Buddhas, for the sake of the unexcelled way, I always taught and transformed you, and throughout long days and nights you have followed me and accepted my teaching. Since I used skillful means to guide you, you have been born into my dharma. Your understanding comes of study and great dedication, determination, conviction. Those are the words that are meaningful to this dialogue, okay? Not faith. Shariputra, in the past I led you to aspire and vow to follow the Buddha way. But now you have entirely forgotten this, and therefore suppose that you have already attained extinction. Now, wanting you to recollect the way that you originally vowed to follow, for all the Sharvakas I teach this great vehicle sutra, called the Lotus Flower of the Wonderful Dharma, by which Bodhisattvas are taught, and which Buddhas watch over and keep in mind. Shariputra, in a future life, after innumerable, unlimited, and inconceivable eons, when you have served some ten million billion Buddhas, maintained the true Dharma, and perfected the way of Bodhisattva practice, you will be able to become a Buddha whose name will be Flower Light Tathagata, one worthy of offerings, truly awakened, fully clear in conduct, well done, understanding the world, unexcelled leader, trainer of men, teacher of heavenly beings and people, Buddha, world-honored one. Your land will be called free of dirt. It will be level and smooth, pure and beautifully decorated, peaceful and prosperous. Both humans and heavenly beings will flourish there. 
It will have lapis lazuli for its earth. Oops. Sorry, I'm doing this on a laptop, so the battery's running low. So we plug it in. Okay. And we keep going. Sorry about that interruption. One day I'll learn how to do this. <laughs> Okay, you know, when he says your land will be this, your land, again, this is a mental exercise. So your land, as I'm talking to you, is your worldview. Quite simply, it's the way you see the world, the planet, the universe, the other people, the, the way you identify thingness. All right. We all claim we live in the same world on the same planet right the same country or whatever but we individually experienced or experience all of this specifically in our own way a lot very very close similarities of course but still the accumulation of our identifications from before birth um, they're just filtered. Uh, that's samsara. That's this condition, right? And that's what we're trying to transcend to the point where we actually go back to our mind, our pure mind, our mind of undistinctive characteristics that's able to look at all of this distinction with fascination and awe without attachment, without attachment as a filter unfiltered reality does that make sense so this is our lands right so when we talk about you know you'll read uh, some sutras or some commentaries about entering the buddha land well it's not some foreign place it's not anywhere else but in your mind and in your mind the buddha of the land is the clarity of unfiltered awareness Make sense? I hope so. It will have lapis lazuli, and uh, he's describing how wonderful that will be. Using the three vehicles, flower like Tathagata will teach and transform living beings. Again, what are the three vehicles? Sarvaka, Prataka Buddha, Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva being the path to the full awakening. It's not that the other paths are now cast away. They're just incomplete. Okay. Shariputra, when that Buddha appears, though it will not be in an evil, an evil age, because of his original vow, he will teach the three vehicle Dharma. His eon will be named, adorned with great treasures. And, <clears throat> sorry, why will it be named this? Because in that land, Bodhisattvas will be considered great treasures. Those bodhisattvas will be countless, unlimited, inconceivable in number, beyond computation or comparison, by parable or simile, such as none can comprehend who does not have a Buddha's wisdom. Wherever these bodhisattvas walk, treasured flowers will receive, will receive their feet. <clears throat> these bodhisattvas will not have just begun to aspire to awakening, for all of them have planted roots of virtue for a long time. Under innumerable hundreds of thousands of billions of Buddhas, they will have observed noble practices in purity, always being praised by Buddhas, constantly cultivating Buddha wisdom, acquiring great divine faculties, knowing well the ways of all the teachings. They will be upright and genuine in character and firm in will and thought. Such bodhisattvas as these will fill that land. This is a reference to us, the bodhisattvas of the earth. Shariputta, the lifetime of flower light Buddha, will be twelve small eons, not counting the time during which he is a prince who has not yet become a Buddha. And the lifetime of people of his land will be eight small eons. After the twelve small eons, flower light Tathagata will assure the bodhisattva full of firmness of his future supreme awakening and will say to all the monks, this full of firmness bodhisattva will become the next Buddha. A Tathagata Arhat full Buddha, this his name will be flowery feet cal calmly walking. His Buddha land will be like mine. 
Shariputra, after the extinction of this flower-like Buddha, the true Dharma will last for 32 small eons, and then the mere, <clears throat> the merely formal Dharma will also last for 32 small eons. Then the world honored one wanting to restate this teaching spoken verse. And so he predicts again the, the future enlightenment of Shariputra, his, his land. <clears throat> You should rejoice and be glad, is how he ends the verses. When all of the four groups, namely monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen, and the gods drag everybody in attendance at this ceremonial sermon discussion, they saw that Shariputra had received his assurance of supreme awakening from the Buddha. Their hearts overflowed with joy and danced in ecstasy. Each took off the outer robes they were wearing and presented them as offerings to the Buddha. Indra, Devendra, Devendra, and Brahma, the king of heaven, as well as others, with countless children of heaven, also made offerings to the Buddha with their wonderful heavenly robes, Mandarava and the great Mandarava, flowers from heaven, and so on. The heavenly robes they had scattered remained in the sky, whirling around and around them by themselves, with hundreds of billions of kinds of heavenly musical instruments, these heavenly beings made music together in the sky, and raining down numerous flowers from heaven. They spoke these words. In the past, at Varanasi, the Buddha first turned the Dharma wheel, and now he rolled the wheel again, the unexcelled greatest Dharma wheel. Then all the children of heaven, to say what they meant once again, spoke in verse. And, you know, Again, I'm going to remind you, this is a contemporary Western uh, uh, translation. And, uh, you know, words like heaven, it's almost better to understand it from a scientific perspective. Uh, you know, Brahma is, is from the ancient Vedic uh, folklore, uh, was... Uh, uh, the the deification of creation. Um, you know this. There's this kind of lore in every world religion, um, and so heaven. Be, you know, for the Greeks, heavens was just the sky. The stars were in the heavens, right? Um, but uh, every religion mythologizes that into an actual uh, a living, uh, not destination, uh, a, a, an abode for these deifications. This is where the gods live, in a place that we can't go to um, until the space program. But uh, you understand what I'm saying. So when things get westernized, they tend to use these ancient references and they can be misleading. So that's the only reason I bring it up again is don't think that Buddhism or Shakyamuni's teachings are about deifications and abodes in, in the skies and so forth. This is a Western man trying to encapsulate the, the many words of Sanskrit and Pali and so on uh, into a a westernly accessible dialogue vernacular um, but i need to point that out because it, it can be not only is buddhism that duality of teaching of the two minds and uh, difficult things to get over but if you add upon that a layer of westernizing the ideas um, it, it can get really difficult to 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 understand clearly or with any uh, penetrative uh, perceptions uh, you, you got to get past a lot of you know i was going to say karma but uh, layers of uh, obfuscation so then shariputra said to the buddha world honored one i know i now have no more doubts or regrets i personally have received assurance of supreme awakening from the buddha but these 1200 who are mentally free while they were at the learning stage in the past, Stravakas, 
were always taught by the Buddha who said, my Dharma can free you from birth, old age, disease, and death and enable you to finally attain nirvana. These people, some still in training and some no longer in training, being free from views of self and about existence or non-existence, thought they had attained nirvana. But now, hearing something they have never heard before from the world-honored one, they have fallen into doubt. This is what I was talking about before we started on this third chapter. Is There are people getting this new information that what they've learned for 40-some years isn't complete. And they're like, huh? So, the world-honored one, I beg you to give causal explanation to the four groups so that they may be free from doubt and regret. Then the Buddha said to Shariputra, Did I not tell you before that when the Buddhas, the world honored ones, by using causal explanations, parables, and other kinds of expression, teach the Dharma by skillful means? It is all for the purpose of supreme awakening. All these teachings are for the purpose of the transformation of people into bodhisattvas. But Shariputra, let me once again make this meaning still more clear through another parable. For intelligent people can understand through parables. Shariputra, suppose in a village, and here we start with the parable a village or a city in a certain kingdom, there was a great elder. He had many fields, houses, and servants. His house was large and spacious, but had only one gateway, only one way in or out. Many people lived in the house, 100, 200, or even 500 in all. Big house. Its halls and rooms were old and decaying, its walls crumbling, its pillars rotting at the base, its beams and rafters falling down and dangerous. All over the house at the same moment, fire suddenly broke out, engulfing the house in flames. The children of the elders, say, ten, twenty, or even thirty, were in this house. The elders, seeing this great fire spring, uh, spring up on every side, was very alarmed and thought, Though I can get out safely through the flaming gateway, my children are in the burning house, enjoying themselves engrossed in play, without awareness, knowledge, alarm, or fear. Fire is closing in on them. Pain and suffering threaten, but they do not care or become frightened and have no thought of trying to escape. You seeing the analogy forming here? People who are ignorant of the teachings of their own Buddha nature, of their of their ability to become bodhisattvas and therefore access their full Buddhahood, their Buddha nature. He's equating them to these children. The world is falling down around them, but they're so engrossed in their delusions, right? Shariputra, this elder, said to himself, My body and arms are strong. I can wrap the children in some robes and put them on a pallet or bench and carry them out of the house. But then he thought again, this house has only one gateway, and it is narrow and small. My children are young, knowing nothing as yet of danger. They are absorbed in their play. Probably they will be burned up in the fire. I must tell them why I am alarmed and warn them that the house is burning and that they must get out quickly or be boomed up, boom, burned up in the fire. In accord with this line of thought, he called to his children, Get out quickly, all of you. Although the father was sympathetic and tried to persuade them with kind words, the children absorbed in their play were unwilling to believe him. And whether <clears throat> believe him and were neither alarmed nor frightened. They didn't even think about trying to escape. What's more, they did not understand what he meant by the fire or the house or losing their lives. They only kept running around playing, barely glancing at their father. The elder thought, this house is already going up in a great blaze. If my children and I do not get out at once, we will certainly be burned alive. Now I have to find some skillful means to get my children to escape from this disaster. Knowing what his children always liked 
and all the various rare and attractive playthings and curiosities that would please them, the father said to them, The things you like to play with are rare and hard to find. If you do not get them when you can, you will be sorry later. A variety of goat carriages, deer carriages, and ox carriages are now outside the gate for you to play with. You must get out of this burning house quickly, and I will give you whatever you, whatever ones you want. Get your choice of great pleasures. If you just leave the house now, because they won't be there later. When they heard about the rare and attractive playthings described by their father, which were just what they wanted, all of the children, eagerly pushing and racing with each other, came scrambling out of the burning house. <laughs> But he's not done. He's going to add another layer of teaching to this. Then the elder, seeing that his children had safely escaped and were all sitting in the open square, no longer in danger, was very relieved and ecstatic with joy. Notice we're not talking about the other 500 people that were living in there. Because that's this is a story. This is a fable, right? Then each of the children said to their father, Those playthings you promised us, the goat carriages, deer carriages, and ox carriages, please give them to us now. <laughs> Shariputra, then the elder gave each of his children equally a great carriage. They were tall and spacious and decorated with many jewels. They had railings around them with bells hanging on all four sides. Each was covered with a canopy which was also splendid decorated, uh, splendidly de de decorated with various rare and precious jewels. Around each was a string of precious stones and garlands of flowers. Inside were beautiful mats and rose-colored pillows. Pulling each of them was a handsome, very powerful white ox with a pure hide, capable of walking with a smooth gait and fast as the speed of the wind. Each also had many servants and followers, to guard and take care of them. Why was this? Because this great elder's wealth was so inexhaustible, his many storehouses so full of treasures, he thought, there is no limit to my wealth. I should not give inferior carriages to my children. They are all my children, and I cherish them equally. I have countless numbers of these car large carriages with the seven precious metals materials. I should give each one to each of the children without discrimination. I have so many large carriages I could give one to everyone in the land without running out. Surely I can give them to my own children. Then the children rode on their great carriages, having received something they had never had before and never expected to have. Shariputra, what do you think about this? Is that elder in giving equally the rare treasure of great carriages to his children guilty of falsehood or not? Okay, I'm going to stop here um, because it's a good stopping point in my estimation. And the point I want to make that I introduced late into that story is that he offered those children, in order to get them out of the burning house, three different types of carriages. But when they finally got it and got out of the house, he didn't give them three different kinds of carriages. He gave them the best, the ultimate carriage, all of them. Because why? Why give them three different? Give them the best possible, right? That is a reference to the three teachings, Sharvaka, Pratyaka Buddha, Bodhisattva. So once again, he's making the point, not only did I use skillful means to bring people up in their relative consciousnesses about the meaning of achieving the Buddha mind, but the levels of teachings that I taught to bring people to Sarvaka, students, Pratyaka Buddhas, experiential uh, Dr. Dereeds, if you will. And then Bodhisattva. Real uh, mentors of the meaning of the teachings. Um, 
those three vehicles are not three. That the meaning of all three vehicles is to get to the Buddha mind, the Buddha way, the full blown, fully awakened teaching. Don't get stuck in the other two. There's only one teaching, the great vehicle. This is it. So in a parable, he not only justifies to all those people who may be doubting why he did what he did and how that mechanism was in his mind all along, but he just needed to deal with the ignorance of the children to get them inspired to get out by using the 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 aspiration of three different vehicles. But once they get out, once they just accept and embrace this, finally come to to safety and knowledge, there's no reason to discriminate. You get the full-blown deal, everyone. So, interesting. Very short fable, but very meaningful, full of meaning. And uh, I'm watching the clock, sorry, but I don't want to run out of time again that, that's happened too many times so with that uh, we will continue in the next video uh, again i appreciate your support in watching this uh, uh, i hope that i'm helping clarify some things and helping you learn more deeply for yourself uh what's going on in, in these sutra and these commentaries and these translations what the Buddha's intent always was and is, and that you yourself are a Buddha. The only thing that keeps us from being in that Buddha mind all the time is all these other distractions. So the more we meditate, the more we chant and connect with that truth, uh, the less we'll be influenced by negative things, the less we'll be uh, attached to things that that create our sufferings the less emotional we'll be um, and the greater joy we'll experience so thank you for joining me on this journey uh, please love yourself <laughs> and uh, i will see you next time daimoku sancho Thank you very, very much.